Hello, I'm Loretta Nostapil. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. I specialize in lymphoma, particularly B-cell lymphomas, including indolent and aggressive lymphomas. So the first case I'd like to discuss today is a young gentleman who presents with a right scalp nodule. It was new in onset and it was actually detected by his uh, hairdresser having frequented them at least once a month. It was in the scalp on the right side. After detection, it actually grew quite rapidly, and so he sought the attention of his primary care physician within a month, had a biopsy revealing diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. On immunohistochemistry, the cells were positive for CD20, CD10, diffusely positive for BCL2, and MYC expression was 40 to 50%. Based on these findings, fish for MYC and BCL2 gene arrangement were sent, and he is now establishing care in our clinic with a known diagnosis of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with incomplete staging. At presentation, he has B symptoms including marked fatigue that's now impacting his ability to work. He also has drenching night sweats occurring more than three times per week, and he has rapid development of subcutaneous nodules including the anterior chest wall and the posterior back. On staging, a bone marrow reveals 10% involvement with an additional follicular lymphoma, CD10 positive, BCL2 positive, and CD20 positive, and he has splenic involvement that is enlarged and hypermetabolic on PET-CT in addition to extranodal sites including the palpable subcutaneous lesions as well as uptake in the right uh, musculature of the upper extremity. So based on uh, exam and laboratory assessment, uh, he's a young gentleman with adequate organ function. He has stage four disease with extranodal involvement, including subcutaneous musculature and bone marrow. He has limited comorbid illness, again, because he's young, less than 60 years of age, and IPI is two given stage uh, and extranodal compartments. We have a lengthy discussion regarding management strategies, at which time we have the fish revealing double hit for MYC and BCL2. Most of the data that's generated in this setting is retrospective, as the identification of a double hit large cell lymphoma is a relatively recent uh, description. We have retrospective data coming out of MD Anderson with a series of 129 cases, which forms the, the discussion as to how we would manage this patient. In our experience, again, retrospective in nature, our dose-adjusted EPOC is the preferred frontline management strategy as it is associated with higher event-free survival and overall survival. And again, this is a young gentleman with a limited comorbid illness and of good performance status prior to his development of lymphoma, therefore he'd likely tolerate this well. He embarks on six treatments and completes this without significant complication, achieving a complete response by PET-CT, which was confirmed by bone marrow biopsy. At this time, we have another discussion. How should we manage someone with double hit large cell lymphoma, which we know to be a poor prognostic factor in terms of durable event-free survival, in terms of what can we do in the post-CR uh, induction in terms of maintaining a longer remission strategy. There are at least two multi-center studies, or at least two studies that are retrospective in nature looking at the post-induction management of patients with double hit lymphoma, including our series, neither of which demonstrate a significant improvement with conditioning or consolidation with autologous stem cell transplant uh, in this setting. However, we do see higher rates of uh, event-free survival. Therefore, all of our patients who achieve a complete response following induction therapy are then referred to our stem cell transplant colleagues to discuss the role of autologous stem cell transplant in the setting of first remission. Again, this is a young patient with limited comorbid illness who tolerated our dose-adjusted EPOC well. Uh, therefore, he has offered high-dose therapy and autologous stem cell transplant in first remission. He undergoes this therapy, tolerating it well. Within three months, he has recovered uh, cytopenias and performance status has improved to the point that he is now fully functional. At this time, he's offered a clinical trial examining maintenance therapy in the post-autologous stem cell transplant setting. Approximately one month into this trial, he develops new subcutaneous mass in the anterior chest wall. This is hypermetabolic on PET, and a biopsy is pursued. This biopsy reveals relapse of his large cell lymphoma, again with uh, MYC and BCL2 gene rearrangement by FISH. At this time, we have another important discussion of how should we manage a patient with relapsed double hit large cell lymphoma and the post-high-dose therapy autologous stem cell transplant setting period. 
He was of limited disease at the time of relapse and again of good performance status and limited comorbid condition. Therefore, we sought a trial exploring CAR T-cell therapy directed at CD19. He underwent conditioning with fludarabine, cytoxin, and dexamethasone, again tolerating quite well, and approximately two weeks later underwent infusion with CAR-Ts. At approximately day 30, he achieved a complete response rate, which has been maintained now 90 days post-treatment. His therapy was complicated by fever that was short in duration without sepsis or other complicating factors. He also had a prolonged headache for approximately two weeks. However, all of these things have fully resolved and he has now resumed his normal activity. This highlights a case of a young gentleman with stage 4 diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with a very poor prognostic feature, the double hit, uh, including MIC rearrangement and BCL2 rearrangement, who had an excellent response to induction of our dose-adjusted EPOC, which is our current frontline approach to these patients. Even though we do not see a significant advantage to undergoing stem cell transplant in the first remission period, this patient did undergo this therapy and unfortunately within six months had relapsed disease that was confirmed by biopsy. I do think it's important to pursue biopsies in this setting to ensure that we know which type of lymphoma we're dealing with as he did have a follicular lymphoma at presentation in the bone marrow as well. And in our retrospective series, approximately 10% of the time, patients with the double hit large cell lymphoma also have either a history of or a concordant follicular lymphoma. Biopsy did demonstrate that he had relapsed large cell lymphoma and at that point we explored novel therapies, likely again because he is a young gentleman with limited comorbid condition which may not be applicable to the population which tends to be a little bit elderly or older when we're dealing with this disease. He has had a very successful outcome, though limited follow-up with a novel therapy directed at his uh, CD19, modifying his T cells. Uh, there are a number of other agents that are currently under exploration, which also demonstrate uh, interest, including targets of BCL2 and uh, other immune therapy checkpoint inhibitors. So what we've learned in management of diffuse large B cell lymphoma with double hit is oftentimes these patients have inferior outcomes in comparison to their, co their counterparts with diffuse large B cell lymphoma of other subtypes. Approximately 13% of the time they will have CNS involvement. This patient did have sampling of his spinal fluid and did undergo prophylactic therapy. It's important that all patients with double hit large cell lymphoma should be screened for CNS involvement at presentation. It is not common practice for patients to have fish sent for MIC or BCL2 on every de novo case of large cell lymphoma. Things to keep in mind is this is more frequent in the germinal center phenotype. We had some uh, tip-offs that he may have more aggressive features given he had MIC overexpression on immunohistochemistry and he presented with a rapid deteriorating, cl deteriorating clinical picture with uh, new subcutaneous lesions that were occurring in the time span of a week, rapid progression in his B symptoms and decline in his performance status, which you may not expect in a young gentleman with a de novo large cell lymphoma, which should prompt you to look for uh, inferior or poor prognostic features such as double hit. In regards to management, we are in need of prospective studies to guide our therapies, particularly frontline and following induction, including the use of stem cell transplant. I think unanswered questions currently is, is there a role for high-dose therapy and autologous stem cell transplant in the first remission? Is there a role for allogeneic stem cell transplant? And is there a comparison or distinguishment between the two types of transplant? Those remain unanswered. Secondly, I think we have struggled with salvaging these patients. We know, again, based on our retrospective series and others, that our standard salvage therapies with chemoimmunotherapy, though intensified, often fail to achieve disease uh, control. We are in need of novel therapies. I demonstrated one such approach, which again is not readily available to those in community practice, but all patients with relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma with double hit features should be seeking a clinical trial. So could we have identified any other features that may have predicted such a poor outcome or at least a double hit large cell lymphoma? This gentleman had limited, if any, comorbid conditions. Uh, he only suffered from allergic rhinitis. Uh, he had a large family, none of whom had had a history of leukemia, lymphoma, or multiple myeloma. 
because he had a large family, he actually has an allogeneic, or he has a matched sibling for allogeneic stem cell transplant. The question that we're now faced with, now that he has achieved a response following CAR T cell therapy, is this a bridge to an allogeneic stem cell transplant? I think it's early to answer that question in regards to we have limited follow-up following CAR T cell therapy. We also know that the duration of the CAR T's uh, may impact outcomes, so oftentimes we're looking for that next line of therapy, including an allogeneic stem cell transplant.